Hello and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Learning the Language of Birds with Holly Merker, professional Hi. birding guide, environmental educator, and Hawk Mountain board member. Welcome, Holly. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. I'm Jamie Dawson, Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And to our audience, thank you for joining us today as well. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. We continue to work to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so very much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during this time of COVID crisis. And we are so excited to offer our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates any donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued accessible resource. We also have a link on our website so that you can connect directly to our YouTube channel. At any time throughout today's program, viewers can submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom platform. We designate a time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. We are absolutely thrilled that Holly Merker is joining us today from Downingtown, Pennsylvania. And before we get started, I'd like to share some of Holly's extensive ornithology experience with our audience. Holly is a professional birding guide. She has been teaching people the art of bird identification by sight, ear, and habitat for the past two decades throughout Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maine, and Florida. She is the co-owner of the ID Boot Camp and Ornotherapy with ID guide author Richard Crossley. Holly is also an instructor and session director for National Audubon's Hog Island Camp in Maine and has worked with teen birders instructing and directing the American, American Birding Association's Camp Avocet. Holly serves as a mentor for the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Young Birders Group and is a co-founder and co-chair of the Frontiers in Ornithology Symposium. Holly is passionate about hawk watching and has been a volunteer hawk counter for Hawk Mountain Sanctuary since 2013. She has recently been elected to the Hawk Mountain Board of Directors. When not focusing directly on birds, Holly works as an environmental educator in Downingtown, Pennsylvania teaching freshwater ecology programs to school students. Holly, it's clear you are a very busy lady and also very passionate about birds. How did you become so deeply interested in birding? Well, I have been um, in love with anything with wings for a long time, captivated since I was a child. So um, I, it just, one thing led to another, um, just from the discovering things right outside my door as a very young child. Uh, you can't help but to notice and want to learn more. So that's, that's part of my story. But I also made a visit to Hawk Mountain when I was a child and uh, forever it'll be imprinted in my heart. Um, just watching the spectacle of migration, there's nothing like it, so. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. So what has been your most rewarding aspect of being involved with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary so far? Absolutely, hands down, it's connecting people to birds. Being able to show people and being able to experience the joy of watching that air show going over the North Lookout, I'm telling you, nothing better than that. I can't wait for fall uh, to be able to sit up there again with everybody and look at the wonders of migration passing overhead. So it's absolutely the connection with the people. The birds are magnificent, but being able to be with others and enjoy that spectacle, that's what it's all about. Oh, thank you so much. And it, it absolutely is a community. And we're so glad that you're such a big part of it. Holly, I think we're all very excited for your presentation, Learning the Language of Birds. I'm going to turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. I'm thrilled to be here, especially sharing for Hawk Mountain, uh, one of my most favorite places on the planet. So 
All right, so I'm going to change my screen over here. Somehow the PowerPoint needs to come up. <laughs> Let's figure out how we can get it. Not seeing it here. Hmm. So do, is there the share screen button? Yeah, so I've got the share screen, but I'm looking to find the actual PowerPoint. Usually it pops up as a PowerPoint. So apologize to everybody out there no watching. Thank you. So, so share computer sound, okay. So I can do it this way with desktop, but I was preferring to do it the other way with, let's see if we can do this, Jamie. No problem. I don't know why. Okay, got it. There you got that right there. Okay, everybody. All right, so stay tuned. I'm going to go into program presentation mode. All right, so learning the language of birds. And we're going to be covering uh, all the sounds that birds make, but especially those songs that we all want to learn so much. All right, so bird song is nature's therapy. Bird song is right outside our door. It's the familiar greeting that's awaiting us, especially at this time of year. Listening to bird song can make us feel relaxed and sometimes even happy. And doesn't that make sense though? Because when you think about it, and, and science proves that music activates the part of the brain that releases the chemical that helps facilitate the feelings of pleasure. Okay, so I'm um, thinking about that. We know that bird songs can provide us with a lot of beautiful music and the earth has music for those who listen. So getting to bird songs. Now birds make songs sound effortless. We walk outside our doors and we hear them belting out these incredible songs and melodies, right? But bird song is often a labor of love. And, and while it is meant to attract, it isn't always that way but it's always meant to grab attention, all right? So birds have an excellent control of their vocal pipes, which are called syrinxes. Now I'm not gonna get too much into the dynamics of the bird's biology or physiology when it comes to making bird song, but I will say that these are organs that are, are it's like a windpipe that creates sound through vibrations, a little different than our larynx. Some birds learn their songs from other birds around them of the similar species, but other birds are pre-programmed with those songs already inside their brains when they hatch. Now, why do birds sing? Well, the obvious most of us know is that the males especially want to attract a mate. And especially at this time of year, there's a lot of singing going on and that's because we're getting into the nesting season. Now, birds are also communicating with others at all times. And so males um, often want to designate their territories to compete with other males. You know, birds can't build fences like people. We have fences, we have property lines to divide where our territories are, but birds do it with their voices. And birds, of course, like other animals, communicate with one another. So they're communicating back and forth. Bird signals alarm to one another. Um, a lot of birds will let other birds and other animals clue in to when there's a predator or danger nearby. And birds, of course, are hormonally driven to sing. So especially at this time of year, the hormones are pumping in, especially with the males, in order to help them sing more robust and louder songs, and they're driven to do it. That begs the question, do female birds sing? Well, research has found that female birds who were once thought not to sing, who are thought to be silent, do actually sing in some species. Okay, so female birds always do make vocalizations. Okay, so they're communicating like we talked about between uh, among each other and also communicating back and forth to males. But many female orioles and also northern cardinal females are already known to sing. So we do know about that, but we're learning more and more about female bird song. And actually there's a citizen science project going on right now um, that is des designed to understand a little bit more about birdsong. Um, Jamie is going to be distributing a link that's going to have some references, and I do believe on there I do have a link for this, but femalebirdsong.org is uh, the website that you can look into if you're interested in that um, citizen science project. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the language of bird sounds, okay? So songs. What is a song? Well, a song is a vocalization that's stretched out. 
often melodious, it has melody, but not all the time, but it's a stretched out vocalization. And some species, and this is where it gets tricky, some species have many different songs to sing. And this challenges us because we have to get to recognize um, multiple songs in order to identify a multi, uh, an individual species. Now, a chip note is a sound we often hear, and we hear a lot of these more so in winter, but at different times of the year, a chip song, a chip so note is a single note that is a call that is kind of brief. So chip, chip, and you might hear this from birds right outside your door. Birds give a completely different call when they're flying. And this is called a flight call, given in flight. And those nocturnal migrants, all those songbirds that are passing overhead at night, especially at this time of year, they're calling out to one another, these nocturnal flight calls, which sound completely different to the sounds we hear them giving while they're on the ground or nearby. Contact calls. These are little tiny calls given back and forth. I think of the white-breasted nuthatch especially. To a pair will be climbing up and down the tree nearby each other. You can hear them calling back and forth and it's this tiny little call. And that's another type of a call, a contact call to keep in touch with your friend nearby. Sort of like a text message. Wing whistles. Okay, so air is circulating against feathers and it creates a sound. The morning dove especially is what we think of when we think of wing whistles. This is doves, are, are, uh, their wing feathers are created to cause noise with friction against, friction against the air. And there's drumming. <laughs> a lot of people at this time of year are getting frustrated with their local woodpeckers, right? Because they're drumming on your house or on your gutter. Well, they've just found the biggest amplifier in town and they're trying to let other birds know this is my territory. So it's a territorial sound as much as it, as it is to attract a mate. So humming, hummingbirds. We think of hummingbirds when we think of wing hums. And of course, with the, the many wing beats of a single hummingbird. Nearby, it sounds a little bit like a buzzing of a bee. All right, so if we wanna find our singers, where do we look? Well, typically birds are singing in a habitat in which they prefer. So you're not usually gonna find shorebirds in your backyard if you have a meadow in Pennsylvania. You're not gonna find sandpipers necessarily singing or, or you're, for example, sandpipers ne don't necessarily sing songs like we're thinking of right here, uh, especially in our region. But what we're thinking about would be um, thinking about birds and the habitat in which we find them. So for example, um, I might not find a swamp sparrow singing in my backyard because I live in the suburbs and there isn't a wetland habitat nearby for them. Um, so they're more often going to sing in those habitats that they're connected to. Now, Sometimes birds will sing while they're going on their migratory journey. So I might hear a veery or a wood thrush that's just passing through my neighborhood. Oftentimes, if we wanna find a singer, it's good to look at ex uh, exposed perches that are possible nearby, edges of trees, the tops of bushes, places like that. And sometimes we can find uh, that birds are singing near their nests. Males often are very vocal because again, they're announcing their territory and they wanna keep other comp competing birds, maybe of the same uh, species, but possibly of other species away from that area. So this begs the question of us, how do we learn the language of birds? So I'm gonna play a um, sound recording and I will say that most of my sound recordings, um, I recorded myself. I don't have fancy equipment. I use my um, iPhone and you can use a smartphone or device. Um, all of these new technologies, these um, smartphones have apps already embedded in them um, that allow for you to record. And they're great. The microphones in the, in the phones today are great for recording bird song and bird sounds. And I encourage you to try it out if you haven't done it already. There are some apps that you can use that are better, that make a cleaner recording. But there's also um, the, the ones that I was mentioning are already in your phone are really good. So 
my reason in mentioning that is because when you hear some of my recordings, uh, you will notice there's a lot of other background noise. But really, isn't that how we hear birds anyway? We're always, our ears are trying to process and filter out a particular song. And so sometimes that can be very distracting. Now I'm gonna play a song for you that also, or it's not a song, I wouldn't say, um, but that also has um, some, uh, some wind distraction, okay? Um, I want you to listen and see if you can identify the loudest bird in this recording. Okay, so I'm guessing most of you got that right. And it's the Canada goose, right? Okay, now how did you know that? Well, when I ask people this question, when I've given this presentation before, everybody says, well, it's because we've seen the bird doing this. We see this bird all the time. We hear it, it vocalizing. We've seen them, we've watched them do it. That's right. If you are watching a bird sing or make a sound, and you have this happen over and over again, you're gonna learn it much faster. And that's one of the biggest tips I can give you is to find birds and watch them sing in order to seal that into your memory. So again, the number one tip I can give you to learning bird song is to find the bird that's singing. That isn't always easy. And sometimes even just being in that habitat is one of the best ways to put yourself in a position to learn a new song. So find the bird that's singing, watch it sing in order to learn how to remember that song. What you need to do is to get your visual and auditory memory working together. Remember that Canada goose. Again, it's repetition of watching and how your brain processes, learning that song. It's an experience and it puts you in a place and you remember so much better if you can do that. So I'm gonna give you some tips on how to do that. All right, the goal here is to create our own outdoor classroom. And I forgot to mention that maybe it's a good idea if you have a notebook to start writing a couple things down. But in the sheet that I've um, distributed for um, Hawk Mountain to give out to you afterwards, there will be some tips that'll go over some of these. But the first thing I can say is this, the outdoor classroom is gonna be your own space. Now it doesn't have to be in your own, uh, outside your own door. Maybe you don't have a backyard that would work well. So maybe it's a spot in a park that you frequent. The idea is to pick a location. It doesn't have to be very big. In fact, I would recommend you start out pretty small, but this is gonna be exclusively for your outdoor bird song classroom. You're already gonna be familiar with that space and that landscape. So you're gonna be able to find your singers quickly because you're not gonna be distracted by other things going on. And that's important because you wanna be able to let your mind relax and focus. So the idea is once you start getting really familiar by repetition, going out into your outdoor classroom consistently, you're gonna get to know the birds that are continuously there what we would call year round residents or local residents. So that when the new singers arrive, the migrants, you'll be more apt to pick them out easily. I would highly recommend that you always bring a notebook when you go out into your outdoor classroom, because you're gonna be making notes. Maybe you're gonna sketch the landscape. Maybe you're even gonna sketch a bird. It's one of the best ways to learn, okay? But also, we're also going to learn about learning how to sketch out and learning to see birdsong as a visual diagram. And that's another reason why I highly recommend it. So how do we learn the bird songs? How can we learn them? Well, one of the biggest tips, and you'll hear this a lot, is developing a mnemonic. And a mnemonic is an association of words that will help you a trigger. It's a trigger that will help you remember the bird sounds and songs that you're hearing. We're gonna go over those in a little while. Also, something that I learned to do really early on is to sing the bird's name with their melody, adding words that associate the bird's name uh, to help remember those songs. 
Um, one that comes to mind is uh, the yellow warbler, which is sweet, 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 I'm so sweet, that kind of thing. I'm gonna go over that when we actually listen to yellow warbler a little later on. But that's, that's a clue is to develop your own songs. And I would highly recommend that you really teach yourself because we can listen to others and learn a lot, but sometimes what other people tell us, like these mnemonics don't work in our own minds. We have to develop what works for us. What are the triggers that are gonna help you remember? Could even be like your kid's name or your, your pet's name thrown in there. It's a trigger that helps you remember. Um, like I was saying, that yellow warbler, sweet, sweet, sweet. Well, what does that mean? Well. Yellow warblers are yellow, and that associates with honey, and honey is sweet. So that's one way to remember. That's what I'm getting at when I'm saying sing the bird's name so you can remember. Watch that bird and spend time dedicated to observing with your ears. Just watch it as much as possible. Put yourself in that habitat and just soak it up. The repetition of listening over and over again is really how you're going to learn best. The most important tip too in your own learning is to be patient with yourself. It's not gonna happen over like, overnight. Like any new skill that you're trying to learn, you're not gonna be an expert right from the beginning, even if you really wanna be. It's hard, it takes many years sometimes to learn and we're all learning um, no matter how, uh, you know, going outside, especially right now when we're all kind of in our uh, COVID-19 lockdowns, it's the best time to learn more about the familiar birds right outside your door because we're gonna notice things we haven't taken the time to look at before. And that's what I love about being able to take the time and focus on the familiar. We're going to learn the most then and it will help us learn more about other bird songs as we go along too. All right, more tips on learning the language of birds. So create realistic goals for yourself. You know, I was saying it doesn't happen overnight and you need to really be patient with yourself. I really think that setting expectations low and then if you can build upon those are really going to help you succeed in learning. Okay, so maybe that goal is gonna be like five new songs a month. You're gonna learn five new songs a month. Challenge yourself to do that. And maybe that's overly ambitious and you wanna maybe do two or three, whatever works for you. See, set your own pace and go along so that it's comfortable. Sometimes if we over, try to overachieve, we burn out quickly and we figure we can't do it. That's not the case. Everybody can learn this. Everybody can learn for song. Morning is always best for listening to songs. I'm sure we all know that right now is the time of year when you have a magnificent dawn chorus going on right outside your door. And birds are especially vocal after they've gotten up and um, the sunrise helps them to bring out their vocal cords and they're vigorous and ready to start the day. So it's a great time for listening. That said, it can be overwhelming and overstimulating because there's a lot of song that's occurring at one time, right? So um, be thinking about that as well, but experience birdsong at different times of day because that'll help you learn. So getting out repeatedly in a single day is also very helpful. So I would recommend like 15 minutes in the morning, then maybe setting aside some time. These are what I call ornotherapy breaks. Okay, so going out and experiencing, soaking up those sounds, like resetting your brain because maybe you were tasking yourself on the computer or doing something else and now you're giving your mind a mental break and you're able to go outside and listen and and have your mind start working in a different way and oftentimes this is a great way to learn and help cement those sounds in so morning afternoon and evening record those songs like i was saying you can use your um cell phones your your mobile phones and uh your tablets other devices to record the sounds so you can go back and listen later and think about deciphering maybe some of those songs we're going to talk a little bit about that too coming up here also one of the best ways to learn of course is to go birding with people who know bird songs and who can interpret them well for you so attend local bird walks most everywhere, there's a local Audubon chapter or another bird club local in your area 
where other birders are so happy to teach. They're so happy to share. Of course, we all love our birds. It's the common ground that brings us together. And, and most birders want to help each other learn because we all want to experience this, those joys together. So find a local bird walk where you can go and learn from other people. Maybe you'll find that um, you've learned something uh, that you thought was one bird but really it's something else. And, and those, those are the clues and those tips that you can learn from other uh, birders who have been doing it for a little longer. All right, so I talked a little bit about visualizing, even sketching out bird songs. We're gonna talk about songs as a visual tool. So songs can be recorded on a smartphone and can be useful in identification. So here you see in front of you on your screen what's called a spectrogram. And this is of a Carolina Wren song that I recorded with my iPhone. And I've put it into eBird, eBird, eBird.org, which is Cornell Lab of Ornithology's worldwide global database, um, storing all sorts of information about where birds are. And birders like you and I can go out and collect information, census the birds in our region with our eyes, of course, and enter our input there. Or we can also take audio recordings and or photographs and embed them into our eBird checklist. And one thing that eBird does for us is it converts it into this sonogram or spectrogram like you see here below, which is uh, the visual diagram of how that Carolina wren in my yard looks. So there's nobody better to teach you how to learn bird song and how to visualize it than the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cornell just for a few minutes because honestly, um, they do such a fantastic job of presenting this diagram. So watch the bird song hero. Here's your chance to become a birdsong hero by playing the birdsong ID game that starts from square one and trains you how to visualize and remember the songs that catch your attention but don't always stick. Time to show what you're made of and become a better birder at the same time. First, let's get you trained. Birders get up before dawn, not just because they're that kind of obsessed, but also because that's when most birds are singing their hearts out. This northern cardinal song is a common early morning sound across much of the U.S., so you might already recognize it. What's amazing is that the bird is performing impressive feats of vocal gymnastics with those repetitive whoops spanning more pitches than a piano in just a tenth of a second. Visualizing a cardinal song helps you fully appreciate the vocal genius. Here on this spectrogram, you see time from left to right and pitch from high to low. And the brighter it is, the louder. Spectrograms stimulate the visual parts of our brain and help us commit song patterns to memory. That's why many birders use them. Now that you've got the basics, you're ready to train your visual brain with Birdsong Hero. To get started, we'll play this Tufted Titmouse song three times. While you listen, compare the three spectrograms and decide which one is the correct match. Then we'll reveal the answer. Here goes. And here comes the answer. The correct answer is B. Titmice repeat the same notes in a series. Compare that with A. Notice how the American Red Start changes things up at the end? And C. The morning dove starts with a little flourish. Okay, 
So hopefully that was a good learning experience. And if you want to learn more, you can find that on the web. That's actually a, a video that lasts a couple more minutes than that. It's kind of fun. But hopefully you got the idea of what I was talking about when I'm talking about drawing out how a sound or song looks. So this will help you later remember to identify. It's like sketching a bird in the field, same thing. Um, and so um, another resource to look at if you're interested in learning to visualize is the Macaulay Library. And of course, eBird has a lot of information on eBird.org, but also you can go to MacaulayLibrary.org and you can look at recordings of birds in other areas of the world and learn about how they sound. And again, these recordings are people like you and I who have used most of the time a simple device like a smartphone to do it, okay? So um, I would encourage everybody to think about how a bird song looks in order to help seal it into your memory. We're gonna go over a bunch of uh, bird songs and calls right now. So this of course has an Eastern bias. So most of the songs and sounds that you're gonna hear are birds that would vocalize in Eastern North America. Now, even if you're on the West Coast of the US or maybe you're, you're watching from somewhere far away, just thinking about how we approach these birds that we're gonna focus on here can help you too learn the songs near where you are. So another thing I want to mention is this. I know that there's a little um, window that shows a picture of me or the speaker. Sometimes for me on my laptop, it's in the top right corner. You can move that around. You can drag it. If it's blocking some of the text or if it's blocking the imagery of the bird, you know, move it around. Um, hopefully it's not too much of a problem. And another thing I want to mention is that you might need to turn up your sound for some of these audio recordings, because again, many of them I have made myself with my phone and they're not gonna be super loud all the time. Now, some of them are um, recorded by Lang Elliott and I do have that noted um, under each recording. They might be even a little too loud for your ears. So you might need to adjust your volume to get your hand near where you can to uh, increase the volume. All right, so we're gonna start off with the Eastern Phoebe and the Eastern Phoebe is a flycatcher. Now, Phoebes are um, one of these birds that have bird song that flycatchers um, are thought to have the bird song pre-programmed in their brain. So you're not going to hear a lot of differences in how they sing. Um, and Phoebes, the cool thing is the mnemonic here is that Phoebes say their name. Okay, so when we're listening to the audio recording, see if you can hear that. Phoebes make a buzzy sound and they also make a chip note, which can often be heard near water. Phoebes are aerial insectivores, meaning they snatch insects out of the air, and they love to be near water, especially in early spring. So here is the Phoebe. Did you hear the Phoebe saying its name? Phoebe, Phoebe Reap. So the ruby-throated hummingbird. So we think of hummingbirds um, as these little feisty little buzzing around birds in our, in our backyards going after nectar, nectar. And you know, if you have hummingbird feeders up that they are just highly aggressive and crazy sometimes, right? Okay, well, they also make a chattering sound in addition to that wing humming that you can hear if you get close to one. And the chattering is often good to learn because you'll know a hummingbird is nearby without even see, spotting it with your eyes just by learning this song. Or it's not a song, it's a chattering. So hopefully you heard that. Um, that was a, a chattering hummingbird in my backyard and he was going crazy because there was another male nearby. Okay, morning doves. Probably a lot of you recognize the morning dove. Um, soft cooing sounds that are owl-like and sometimes sound sad. That's how they got the name morning. Okay, so we're gonna listen to that.
So you probably just heard the wing whistle that was in that audio clip there. And again, doves are birds that make that kind of whistling sound when they take off and first see the flight. Um, as much as we recognize the cooing sound, we're probably also going to recognize that one as well. So we'll move on from morning dove to another uh, bird that can be found in a lot of backyard landscapes, the red-bellied woodpecker which makes a couple of different vocalizations. As we said before, woodpeckers use the drumming in order to announce territory and also to attract the mate. Of course, they're using that as a tool to excavate, to get insects and other um, little invertebrates out of dead wood, okay? But they're using, especially at this time of year, those, those drumming sounds to um, designate their territory. Now, I'm gonna play the, uh, the one of the call sounds that they make. See if you can hear it. It's, this one is the purr, purr, purr. So that's not really a true song, but it is a sound that we um, are often going to be familiar with. Uh, in our own backyards or in landscapes with lots of ma uh, mature deciduous trees. We're going to get into the chickadees next. And chickadees are really exciting. And here in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of chickadee dilemmas, okay? Because in the southern part of the state, the southeastern part of the state, um, we have the Carolina chickadee as our dominant chickadee species, okay? That's the one in the top right in this imagery, okay? Now, the Carolina chickadee is increasing its northward range. So each year, the Carolina chickadee moves northward and maybe um, there will be a presentation on, on this phenomena of chickadees and the hybridization. So what's happening is chickadees are, uh, the, the Carolinas and the black cats are um, mating with one another and creating hybrid offspring. And the tricky part there is if you are in the hybrid zone, and in Pennsylvania, this is fluid. It's constantly moving northward. Um, but, um, and I honestly don't know exactly the northern limits at this moment. I think it's somewhere up in Lehigh County, if I'm not mistaken, or Northampton somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's increasing uh, each year. But um, what's happening is that these two birds, because song has learned, are singing both, the hybrids are singing both songs of both species. So this gets complicated for some of us if we live in that hybrid zone. And you can find information on where that is. Um, but generally, we're gonna go over the, the dominant species. So we're gonna go over the Carolina chickadee first. And this is a very fast, they're a little bit smaller than the black caps um, in size. And they have a much, a rap, much more rapid um, chickadee dee dee song. And um, their song is a Phoebe Phoebe, okay? So the chickadee dee dee is a call, I would say, and the other is a song. Let's listen. Okay, I'm gonna play that in comparison to the black cat chickadees deeper, slower, D, 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 D. Okay, see if you can tell the difference. Did you hear that? So take a D, 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 D. Okay. All right, but they both have songs that are different from one another. So I'm gonna first play the Carolina Chickadee. Oop, that's not the right one. That's also a call. Something's playing style things. Let's go into the black cat. This is black cat. Some people say that they're saying, hey, sweetie. Not sure if that works for everybody. Let me see if I can get this um, Carolina Chickadee audio going, because for some reason it's not prompting. I'm, not, I'm kind of confused. You know what? We'll come back to that. There it is. E -D -E -D -A. So that's the Carolina chickadee. All right, we're going to move on to their cousin, the tufted titmouse, who sings Peter, 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 or Peter, Peter, Peter.
They also have a scolding note. So I like to think of tufted titmice as like the town criers. If there's something interesting going on, or if there's a predator nearby, they're gonna let everybody know about it. And this is one of the sounds that they make to alert others of danger or something very curious. that it's always good to look around to see why the titmouse is calling attention. Okay, the red breast, <laughs> the white breasted nuthatch. The white breasted nuthatch is a common uh, bird in a lot of uh, urban landscapes and also suburban landscapes that have mature deciduous trees. They make a lot of different vocalizations. As I was saying before, they do make some really neat little contact calls. And I would challenge you to get out and try to listen for those contact calls. Find some nut hatches and get out and see if you can hear them making that sound. But I'm gonna play the most common uh, sound that they make, which is a uh, rapid nasal yank, 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 yank. That's what it sounds like. But maybe you think it sounds like something, another word to describe. Okay, hopefully you could hear the yank, 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 yank. All right, we're gonna move on to the Carolina Wren. Now, a lot of times these little brown birds have vocals that are just amazing and they can belt out songs that are with volume that is unbelievable. We're gonna go over a couple of these. So the male Carolina Wren can learn up to 40 different songs and that's where they get tricky because they can vary what they sound like. But People use mnemonics like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, or cheeseburger, 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 or chunkity, 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 chunk. Let's see what you think. First, I'm gonna play the sound that they make. This is, sort of, this is a call. It sounds a little bit like someone stroking the um, tines of a, um, a comb, okay? But next, we're gonna get into a song, and we're gonna start hearing something like this. All right, so this bird, the American Robin, is easily recognizable. A lot of my neighbors tell me they, get, they have to shut their windows in spring because of the loud dawn chorus, and that's mostly made up of these American Robins singing. And Robins have a very cheerful kind of song, cheery, cheerily, cheery up. And they make a lot of different vocalizations, in fact. And so we're gonna play just a couple. This is a traditional song. Okay, another bird that is in the same family, that is the thrushes, um, with the robin is the wood thrush. And they have a beautiful flute-like harmonious sound because the syrinx is producing two vibrations at one time to create one harmony that is unbelievable. And I know many of us are looking forward to the arrival of the wood thrush back into our landscapes coming up here soon. Today is the 17th within the next week. We probably should be hearing our first wood thrushes here in Pennsylvania. So they sound a little bit like viole. Listen to the sound and see what you think. Okay, coming soon to a forest and woodland near you. Eastern Bluebird is another thrush and they have a sound 
that is a little softer. It sounds a little different than the other thrushes. It's uh, gurgly and, and to my ears and very gentle. It has a lot of surf, surf, soft chirping warbles. See what you think. A lot of people say that they say cheer, cheerful charmer, or something like that. All right, we're going to move into some warblers. Okay, so this is the yellow warbler. And again, I was talking a little bit earlier about mnemonics, how to remember bird songs by associating with other words um, or memories. And so this was, this is the one that people associate with the mnemonic, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. And maybe other people have other mnemonics to share regarding yellow warbler. But this one, again, the sweet association is not just because the bird is sweet and beautiful and the sound is sweet, but also think about how it's gonna match in your memory. Because if I say sweet, 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 I'm so sweet, that's great, but what bird is that? Well, trigger that this is, oh yeah, that's right, it's a yellow bird and that bird is sweet because like honey. And so, oh yeah, yellow warbler, that's right. Okay, that's the kind of thought process you need to lead your brain on that journey so that it can remember why this mnemonic is sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Otherwise, it won't make sense. So we're gonna listen to that one next. Did you hear that? Sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Whoops. Let's play that one more time just so you can hear it. Very sweet sound as well. Okay, the common yellow throat is another more common warbler in most habitats and landscapes, especially edges. And they sing something that sounds like witchity, witchity, witch. We'll move on to the black and white warbler. And the black and white warbler look like little tiny zebras walking up and down trees. Okay, so they're eating small invertebrates and in little crevices of bark. And here you see one around some Spanish moss, um, picking through the lichen for little types of aphids and other organisms. So the black and white warbler makes a squeaky dog toy like sound. See what you think. And forth. And so when we hear that sound, there are a couple of warblers that make similar sounds. It sounds like rocking back and forth, um, sounds that are, are um, very high pitched. And this is a little bit squeakier, a little bit has a little more rasp to it than some of the other birds that have that similar, like Cape May warbler sounds similar, um, as does bay breasted warbler. But listen to this again. Okay. Next, we're going to look at the oven bird and how it sounds. So teacher, teacher, teacher. That is the common mnemonic that most people will use. The interesting thing about this, because there are a couple other birds, including Carolina wren or Kentucky warbler, that make a similarly sounding pattern and from similar habitats sometimes. Um, but this one sounds like somebody's turning up the volume of the radio, okay? during that song. So it starts out slow and, and, and a little bit um, not as loud and then turn up the volume increasing as it goes. See if you can hear what I'm talking about. Okay, can you, hopefully you heard how it increases in volume as it's broadcasting. That's the oven bird. So again, found in forested landscapes um, and coming soon if you live in Pennsylvania to a forest near you. Okay, so indigo bunting. All right, so indigo bunting. This is, everybody loves to spot an indigo bunting. And a lot of times the males can be found um, against an edge. Uh, if there's a field um, and there's a forested edge, it's hard to pick them out because 
they blend in really well, but they love to sit in prominent spots. So, um, and oftentimes even from wires along the road, telephone wires. So keep your eyes out for them there. They sound, sing a song that sounds like one, one, two, two, three, three, or fire, fire, where, where, here, here. See if you can hear what I'm saying uh, with those mnemonics in this audio recording. So the idea there is not so much the mnemonics, but it's the pattern, the repetition of that same pattern over and over again. The American goldfinch is one that everybody loves to see. Um, and at this time of year, they're extremely vocal. So one thing to clue into is the flight call, which is the potato chip sound. Kids love that. And remember that potato chips are also kind of yellowish, right? So the American goldfinch, that's the sound it makes. Okay, so Song Sparrow. Song Sparrow is um, belting out a lot of songs at this time of year. Uh, it really any times of the year. They're very vocal singers. And their song is typically introduced by two or three clear whistles that's followed by a more complex melody that differs from individual to individual. But if you learn how the song is sung with those introductory notes followed by a complex melody, it doesn't matter when you go to a different location, you still recognize it as a song sparrow by the pattern that it follows. So listen to the songs. Oh, I have a video. So that was the video of the song sparrow actually singing. Let's listen to the recording. So hopefully you heard those introductory notes followed by the melody. Those two different song sparrows that I recorded were uh, singing completely different songs, but always followed that same pattern. Okay, we're going to move on to another sparrow, the Eastern Toei. And Toei have two very distinctive um, sounds that they make. First off, they get their name Toei from the Toei, Toei of their uh, call notes, but also they sing, drink your tea, see if you can hear that. There's a tweet. White-throated sparrow. White-throated sparrow has a beautiful song that sounds like either they're singing pure, sweet Canada, 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 or if you're from Massachusetts, you might say, poor Sam, peabody, peabody, peabody. Let's see what you think. Maybe you even have another mnemonic to help us all remember that one. All right, so the Northern Mockingbird is one of these mimics. Say okay? they're in a mimic family, uh, along with Brown Thrasher and Gray Catbird. The Northern Mockingbird is known to make over 2,000 sounds and they bank them all into their repertoire of songs and they can mimic um, anything really that's nearby or in their own environment. And sometimes they throw us ear birders off because they're mimicking the sound of a bird. And sometimes it's like, why is that species around? And then you realize it's actually a mockingbird. You have to really think about maybe what you're hearing. 
Um, so they repeat the same phrases over and over again, multiple times. Ground thrasher usually uh, repeats the same phrase two times or maybe two or three times uh, repeatedly as it goes along in its pattern of sequence. But the northern mockingbird usually repeats it more than three times. See what you see and what you think here. All right, we'll move on to their cousin, the gray catbird. So the interesting thing about catbirds, they too can build a repertoire of a thousand songs, but they're actually phrasing them different. They don't repeat like that. They kind of one phrase to the next and you can hear it. They also make sounds that give them the name catbird, that the kind of mewing sound and um, sometimes sound like they're saying Mary, I think, at least the ones in my neighborhood. Red-winged blackbirds. Red-winged blackbirds are often associated when they're making noise with wetland habitats. And that's because that's their preferred nesting area. Um, and we will often hear them making a sound, especially in spring, that sounds like honkery. They also make a um, hard check, check call note, which if you get familiar with, you'll be able to pick up because they make this uh, call oftentimes in flight and sometimes um, when they're in a certain habitat um, where they are kind of calling back and forth to others. So listen to what you think. Northern Cardinal is one that most of us are familiar with, right? And so northern cardinals are birds of uh, our backyard landscapes and all around, especially here in the east. But they make a very cheerful, I think they're like the cheerleaders of the song world. Cheer, 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 bright, 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 birdie, 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 excited about birds. Let's see. Always clear and very robust clear whistles. Clear, bright, bright, bright. Okay, here's the bald eagle. Of course, it's Hawk Mountain, so whereas this isn't a song, actually, it's a good one to learn, especially because it's often uh, misidentified, okay? So here's the thing. What I mean is the bald eagle probably doesn't sound like the fierce raptor that it looks, right? It makes a completely different sound that some people liken to a, a chicken peeping or maybe even a dolphin, okay? The thing is, is that that sound is, it, it carries really well across water, which is the bald eagle's preferred habitat because they eat fish for a living, mostly. So hear what you think about how mighty and fierce this bird sounds. But the thing is, is that this bird, our red-tailed hawks, make a scream or a call that sounds really fierce. Exactly what we think of when we think about a fierce apex avian predator, that is the top of the food chain in the bird world. So I'm gonna play that sound and you'll see what I mean. And this, it's so Hollywood, I guess they don't like the fact that the bald eagle doesn't sound fierce and mighty, especially as it's our national symbol. So instead, they'll dub this one in, and I'm sure most of you have heard this before. <laughs> I 
All right, we're gonna move on to our nocturnal predator, the great horned owl. And this is the familiar hoot owl sound that a lot of people are often very familiar with. And you'll hear pairs duetting back and forth. So if you hear one singing, listen and see if you can hear its mate nearby. The male has a deeper voice than the female. All right, so we've heard a lot of different sounds today. The black-throated green warbler was the bird that, was, that inspired me to start learning bird song more aggressively. I thought I knew some songs. When I first heard this song, I couldn't believe a bird was making the, the noise. And I was determined to start to learn more about bird song. And from there, it just sent me down a rabbit hole. Because <laughs> once you start learning, you can't really stop, right? OK, what song is it for you? What's your black-throated green spark bird that's gonna send you, launch you into the journey of learning bird song. I can't wait to hear about it. So here's here's the black bird again. All right, well, thank you everybody so much for listening in today, tuning in uh, to learning the language of birds. I hope I gave you a couple of new tips to set you off on, on your quest to learn some bird song in your area. Um, again, I wanna thank Hawk Mountain Sanctuary uh, for, for hosting me today and allowing me to share my love of the language of birds with you and everybody else. Um, and also all of the uh, resources I've listed here. Again, um, I think Hawk Mountain is gonna be providing you a link where you can find um, some of my references. Also, I'm going to give you a couple of tips on some apps to use uh, to learn a little bit better um, in the field. Um, and I wish you all lots of happy uh, bird song um, listening ahead. So, Jamie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Holly. That was absolutely fascinating. And I just want to share with you we've had so many positive comments from viewers throughout your whole presentation expressing how much they enjoyed uh, what you've been teaching them oh. and it was so so great job Thank and you. it was really interesting to see we have uh, viewers joining us all the way from New York to Mexico so that's oh. fantastic okay Holly here's one question okay so when you're talking about people need to find their own outdoor classroom to begin learning um, does it matter? Should it be the classroom? Is it better if the classroom is more of a sunny location, a shaded location, or does it not matter? I don't think that matters. It has to be a location that is comfortable for you, okay? The birds are going to come and go in that, that little spot, your outdoor classroom, and that's the goal. What you want is to be uh, in an environment that is as less distracting as possible. Um, it, you know, um, not all of us are lucky enough to have a space that's not going to have other people or other noises, but most of those noises are going to be familiar to you anyway, and you're going to be able to tune those out. Even some of the local uh, birds that once you get to know some of the residence birds, you're going to learn how to tune them out to pick up and clue in on new birds coming into your area. So I would say pick what's comfortable to you. Um, as far as like what birds prefer, of course, in the morning, you can always find birds f uh, in the sunniest areas because they're warming up. The sunny areas are warming up the insects. It's all about the food, okay? So you want to find an area where there's an abundance of bird food for birds to um, be present. And so that's where I think you're going to um, be most comfortable and increase your chances of, of more birds. Thank you so much. Okay, our next question is from a primary school teacher. And she is asking, what tips do you have for introducing my elementary school students to identifying birds and their songs? Do you have any book suggestions for kids or for anyone who is interested in birds? Right, so that's a great question. And I work with elementary school students as well, um, helping them learn bird song. So again, I would follow those same kind of uh, the steps that I gave before of starting out with the most common birds. Get to know your local residents first. 
once you start mastering their languages, you'll be able to learn more. So birds that are loud, like the Canada goose, right? Or American crow, something that's common um, in some areas. It might be that Eurasian collared dove, or it might be a pigeon, a rock pigeon, um, if you live in an urban landscape, or house sparrow. And even these sounds are, are really good for, for kids and, and everybody to clue into because it's the familiar and you'll have those opportunities to watch and listen. So that would be my first suggestion is to start with low goals, like a couple birds, focus really on those. Try not to overwhelm yourself or your students um, by too many um, confusing sounds. Um, again, Hawk Mountain is going to be providing you a link that has uh, references. So I won't go over those here. I'll let you find those on that link. But feel free to ask me any questions. I put my email on there too. So reach out to me if you would like to communicate more about that. Thanks so much, Holly. Okay, another question. How have ornithologists determined that some birds have their songs pre-programmed in their brains when they hatch as opposed to learning. It's so interesting. Yes, it really is. And I am not a uh, bird biologist when it comes especially to how birds learn, but there are many fascinating studies out there where people have taken birds and they've, they've watched them in the field. They've done a lot of research using recordings and noting behavior, but also isolating birds out of that habitat to learn more about them um, in research labs and understanding how the process of song is learned. Um, one thing that's really cool is like if I go to a different part of the country, for example, red-winged blackbirds, um, I notice they sound very different on the west coast than they do here in the east. I still recognize their song right away. It's still conqueree, but it has a different dialect. So birds are learning different songs and different ways of just like we are, just like people, we have different accents or dialects wherever we go, right? So um, it's really fascinating stuff. So I would encourage you to learn more about that um, and there and access some papers. There's a lot of information and content online, right, about that. And in some of the book references that I give you, you'll learn more about that as well. Wonderful, thanks so much, Holly. Another question, I hear birds, but really have trouble spotting them. Any tips? <laughs> yeah, that's always a challenge for all of us, really. So don't feel bad. And if you can't find a bird to see and watch, that's okay, okay? Um, it, we, it, it doesn't always happen. I will say that in spring especially, I probably see 20% of the birds that I'm identifying because I'm identifying them by ear, to be honest. A lot of times birds are intentionally obscured or they're at, they're at a level in the forest a canopy where I just can't see them okay? And they're hiding or tucked in. So you're not going to see every bird. So don't feel bad if you don't. Um, but again, some of the tips are to look for exposed edges and be patient. Learn to teach your brain. It's called search image. If you think of a bird, if you think about northern cardinal, you know you're looking for a red bird um, and, and you're, you're looking for a red bird that might be in an exposed area because male birds, especially at this time of year, are going to more aptly sing from prominent perches because, again, it's that territorial instinct and drive that's putting them there. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions about uh, the hybridized chickadees you were talking about. And before I read the question, I, I think you alluded to this, Holly. At Hawk Mountain, we are um, featuring this topic on one of our uh, autumn lecture series on October 24th, behavioral variation in hybridizing chickadees from the Cray Lab. So if you're interested. Mm -hmm. So the question is, would a hybridized chickadee make a mixture of the two songs? We have a chickadee nesting in a birdhouse in our garden, but the but the sounds it makes sound like a mix of both. And do female chickadees sing? Okay, so um, first, yes, the hybrids do sing both songs. So it's not a good way to identify um, a chickadee if you live in that hybrid zone by the vocalizations because a hybrid bird could be singing both the Carolina, or Carolina chickadee and the black cap chickadee songs. Okay, so we do know that. Um, as far as whether or not female chickadees sing, my understanding is that they don't, but um, a good person to listen to is Dr. Curry, who has done extensive amount of research on chickadees, especially those here in Pennsylvania. Um, and I know that he'll be able to answer that because again, like we were talking about how do we know about how birds learn songs, 
people that go out and study and spend many hours watching birds sing and, and recording those vocalizations, that's how we learn. And we're making new discoveries all the time. So maybe you too will make a new discovery in your own yard. Thank you. We have so many questions coming in. I know we're not gonna have time uh, for all of them, but I wanna try to squeeze in one or two more. Holly, when would a wood thrush make it to New York? Well, okay, so wood thrushes are on their way, starting to move north from their wintering grounds now. Today is April 17th, and I'm expecting by the end of the month, we should start um, hearing our first wood thrushes. So within the next 10 days, we'll probably be, if you go out on some, uh, uh, in the morning, especially thrushes like to sing at first light and also at the end of the day. That's why we have that magnificent dawn chorus of the robins. Um, but uh, you will, we'll probably start be hearing them then. It's certainly by the first week of May, you're gonna start hearing your wood thrushes returned and singing their hearts out. And I know I can't wait. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, because we're Hawk Mountain, I can't resist squeezing in uh, two questions that are migration related, and I'm gonna combine them. Okay, now how do you find the different flyways and do birds change their song during migration? Mm, great question. <laughs> well, finding different flyways. Okay, so huh, that, that, that gets a little complicated, but we know that um, first off, songbirds are migrating at night, um, and we know that we can look at bird radar. I'm going to encourage everybody to go to a website called birdcast.org, and that's put together with a collaboration between the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and some other researchers you will be able to see birds migrating in action on something that, on BirdCast, it's a Doppler radar. Um, but in the east, we have a couple of uh, migration corridors. Birds are heavily influenced by uh, weather, okay? So what's going on in our weather? So we have had a lot of northerly winds. Once we get those southerly winds again, we're gonna start having birds being forced up through migration. And in the eastern region, I mean, birds are migrating over you at all times, okay? So whether or not they put down, that's another question. Again, look at that birdcast.org to understand a little bit more about bird migration. And I think we'll probably have some upcoming presentations on that through Hawk Mountain, so stay tuned for those. Um, and the second part, Jamie, what was it again? Um, about Do birds change their song while they are migrating? Okay, so, um, I don't think the song has changed as much so while they're migrating, because I hear a lot of migrant birds singing. Now, when they get on territory, they're probably a little bit more rea relaxed. They have maybe some different pressures uh, to face, um, and they're probably singing a little bit more of a repertoire. So some warblers, for example, um, you'll hear them singing one or two variations, but then when they get onto their nesting grounds, they're probably singing their full repertoire. Maybe they have five different songs that they might sing, and you might hear that more aptly when they're actually on their nesting ground versus when they're migrating. But generally, they sound the same and you can still readily identify them. Thank you so much, Holly. And again, what an amazing, amazing presentation. Um, we all thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And again, I apologize. We don't have time to go through all of them. I encourage you to look through the resources uh, from Holly to help you continue with your practice. And also, as Holly mentioned in her presentation, you're welcome to contact her through email if you have additional questions. Um, so thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a great weekend. Happy migration. Happy migration. And Holly um, will also be um, a special guest speaker with us on, I believe, is it May 13th? We have a program, Citizen Science and You, as she's very involved uh, with Cornell's um, eBird. So um, some other upcoming virtual programs we have that you hope we hope you can join us for include tomorrow, Saturday, April 18th, online artist talk and family workshop um, at 10 a.m. in collaboration with Lehigh University. This Sunday, the 19th, we have horseshoe crabs, keystone to shorebird migration and survival at 11 a.m. On Earth Day, Wednesday, April 22nd, we have Via Wildlife Hero at 1 o'clock p.m. and Rosalie Edge, The Tie That Binds at 7 o'clock p.m. And on Wednesday, April 29th, we have Meet the Kestrel at 1 o'clock p.m. And on Sunday, May 3rd, we have Rachel Carson, Inspiration, Legacy, and Challenge at 2 o'clock p.m. 
thank you all so much. Holly, thank you. Thank you. For now, we hope to see you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.